Can a client sue a lawyer for deceit in the administration of legal fees? To find out, you have to read Urias versus Botafuco, but it's 13 pages. Don't have time for that? I've got you covered. This is TLDR Too Long Didn't Read, where I cover New York Court of Appeals cases, and I try to do it in five minutes or less. This is the episode on the case of Urias versus Botafuco. The citation for this case is 2024, New York Slip Opinion 01497, published by the New York Court of Appeals on March 19th of 2024. The issue in this case is whether a client of a lawyer can sue that lawyer in a plenary action for deceit, or whether they have to alternatively try to vacate the judgment or settlement uh, based upon that deceit or misconduct or misrepresentation. The background that's helpful to understand this case, three different things. First, under, C- under civil practice law and rules, CPLR 5015, a party can move to vacate a judgment based upon a number of different grounds. And one of those grounds is fraud or misconduct on the part of an attorney. The other thing you have to understand is that under judiciary law 487, it's a punishable offense for an attorney to engage in deceit or collusion with the intent to deceive a court or a party. In fact, it's an offense that is both a misdemeanor, so there's a criminal pun- punishment if that's established, and a party who's injured by that conduct can get treble damages. That's the word they use, meaning triple damages, three times as much as what the damage is. And lastly, you have to, you have to understand that there's a, uh, under judici- judiciary law 474A, 474-A, that's a schedule, a fee schedule that an attorney is required to use, a plaintiff's attorney or a med mal, a, you know, podiatric, dental uh, malpractice attorney, um, have to use this schedule of fee compensation for their services. And it's, 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 it's a schedule like this. It's graduated. So it's 30% of the first $250,000. Recovered, 25% of the next $250,000 recovered, 20% of the next $500,000 recovered, 15% of the next $250,000 recovered, and then 10% over $1.25 million. Um, that's the allowed schedule uh, that of, of attorney compensation for those kinds of cases. All right, what are the facts here? The facts are that the subjects of this case are Mr. and Mrs. Urias. Mr. Urias had a surgery that landed him in a coma. So he couldn't initiate a lawsuit by himself. So Mrs. Urias, his wife, uh, obtained a guardianship for him, became his guardian after applying for guardianship. And then she became his guardian with the power to initiate this medical malpractice lawsuit. And she hired an attorney and the attorney had her sign a retainer, including the fee compensation under that schedule of 474-A, right? Allowing that that graduated uh, recovery. The attorney then sued the four different medical malpractice providers and got a settlement of $3.7 million. When it came time to pay the bill, how the attorney calculated his uh, fees was not all in one lump sum. He calculated his fees as against each of the four defendants separately and then aggregated it, which led to a fee of approximately or over $800,000 as opposed to let's say $500,000. So there were several hundred thousand dollars more the way the, the attorney calculated his fees uh, because he did it a specific way, which is as against each defendant, as opposed to considering it one cause of action, one claim, and therefore taking the recovery just from the big lump sum of 3.75, 3.7 million. So at that point, the client, Mrs. Urias, instead of moving to vacate the judgment saying, well, I didn't understand the fee structure, she sued her attorney under that attorney uh, misconduct, a judiciary law 47 claim, said, my attorney deceived me and deceived the court. He, I paid several hundred thousand dollars more than I should have, and he should have to pay me treble damages. So at that point, it goes to the Supreme Court, the, the lowest court, the trial court, and the court says, no, this is improper because the only remedy available to Mr. Rias is vacating the judgment under 5015. She didn't do that. It goes to the appellate division and they affirm what the trial court says. Now it goes to the court of appeals. And the question here before them is, can a client sue an attorney in a plenary action, a wholly separate action, or are they limited, like the appellate division said and the trial court said, to moving to vacate first? And the court of appeals holding is the client was right. The client can pursue, a client can pursue her attorney in a plenary action, a brand new index number, a brand new action against the attorney for violating Judiciary Law 487, 
There's no exclusivity in the statute and they're not going to impose an exclusivity. It's not one or the other. It can be both or it could just be the plenary action. And the second question that they answer though is they say, as to this particular set of facts, is summary judgment appropriate? And they say yes. So even though the client can sue the attorney in a plenary action, under these facts, there's no deceit because they say uh, 487 does not lie. That's not a proper cause of action when it's just a disagreement on strategy or tactics or law. That's not what deceit is. So they say, in this particular case, Ms. Ms. Urias, Mrs. Urias did not adequately allege there was any deceit here. So they say, we're, this is a proper kind of cause of action, but we're granting summary judgment, dismissing it because it's, there's no deceit even alleged. And that's the case of Urias versus Buttafuoco. Have a good day. If you like what you just saw and want to see more just like it, please hit like or subscribe to let me know. 